What's good, party people? This is According to Woods, and I have the honor and privilege of talking to a Bellator veteran, a, a cast member of season 19 of The Ultimate Fighter. He is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, a consummate catch wrestler. He's the one and only crossface, Kelly Adamson. Kelly, Thank what's you, going man. on, my man? Just uh, training my ass off, man. That's all I'm doing. Working and, and training and running my gym. Yeah, and I mean, your gym. Uh, let's talk about that because you are a legit snake pit. I mean, like from Wigan, England, you know, you're a legit snake pit affiliate. Yep. So uh, how that all came about, um, I've kind of always had a wrestling style uh, mixed in with my jujitsu, with fighting and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've always studied the history and always been a huge fan. And uh, I've uh, got to meet with Joel Bain, uh, one of the head guys of Snake Pit. And he, we, we, we've been talking, me, him and Kenny Lester. And, and we decided it was the right uh, direction for me to go. So we're, uh, we're one of the only Snake Pit gyms on the West Coast. And uh, we're looking to really grow it here on the West Coast. You know, it's pretty big right now on the East Coast and in Europe and in Japan. But uh, we're going to bring it to the West Coast and kind of try and grow it more. Oh, man. I I mean, I've got goosebumps. Uh, you know, because to me, I think, you know, of course, you know, no disrespect to, you know, obviously Brazilian jiu-jitsu, Japanese jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. um, and even, you know, the 10th planet system that, you know, has kind of percolated, you know, the, the grappling, the submission grappling world. No disrespect mm -hmm. to any of those facets and obviously they all have their viability in the world of submission grappling but catch to me is one of i mean it is the lost art you know and again it's it's almost like the, the nwa where you could you know trace all of the the current wrestling promotion and trace it back to the national wrestling alliance well the same mm -hmm. to catch every grappling style right up to like maeda right who's brought mm -hmm. you know uh, style of, of submission grappling to Brazil uh, and taught the Gracies. Well, a, a large part of it, and a lot of things don't get talked about, but a large part of it was catch. Well, I mean, catch is everything. I mean, that's where it all came from. You know, uh, uh, back in the day, uh, Maeda just took catch wrestling and mixed it with Western wrestling and, and traditional jujitsu from Japan and, and came up with judo, you know, and then uh, that's where it all came from. It's all come from catch wrestling and came from real, real pancreation wrestling. You know, we weren't there obviously, but the first Olympics, like I'm pretty sure they had submissions. It wasn't a point system like wrestling. It was catch wrestling, you know? So the history is there. If you're, if you dig deep enough, you'll find the whole history of jujitsu through catch wrestling. No, 100%. And it's funny because, you know, here we are in like 2020 and we should have, I mean, theoretically speaking, you know, if COVID had not kind of taken the world by storm, um, you know, we would have had an Olympics and the, the wrestling was going to be off of this kind of incarnation of the Summer Olympics because it wasn't in the eyes. And you know what I, I think is it's like it's gotten so far and away from what the original, you know, either pan creation or catch was mm -hmm. in terms of the wrestling, that that's the reason why. And if you implemented some of the stuff that, I mean, were literally in its origins, you wouldn't have any problem guarding eyes or sponsorship deals because mm -hmm. you're seeing, you know, guys and gals getting thrown to hell and submitted and, you know, case well, I mean, and all that jazz. The closest thing you have we have now is Abu Dhabi. I mean, you see guys from judo backgrounds, you see guys from jiu-jitsu backgrounds, you see guys from wrestling, sambo. That's really the true grappling Olympics right now, you know. That's where you're going to see the top athletes from all disciplines coming together and it's not considered jiu-jitsu, wrestling, judo or what. It's it's grappling. That's what grappling is. Grappling is all all grappling, all martial arts put together, you know. So that's the, the beauty of it. And that's why I respect ADCC the most more than IBJJF more than any of the other tournaments is because that's the real deal. It's that's, you know, you got slams, you have throws, you have takedown points, you have all the stuff there. So anybody from any discipline can use, can go to Abu Dhabi and be effective if they're good at their, their discipline. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, you know, I, I, kind of hate that, you know, politics has kind of taken, you know, kind of a precedent because, I mean, I, I think I was doing a, 
a, a interview with uh, you know the guys at CSW under Eric Paulson and, and head coach Ben Jones, right? Mm. And they were saying that Ben was telling me that IBJJF doesn't recognize Eric Paulson's black belt, and I'm just like, what? What are well, we doing? I mean- IBJJF is a is a cash grab. I mean, really, it's all about getting money. It's all about bleeding people, nickeling, diming them. Uh, that's why I just I won't go to the IBJJF tournaments. I won't register with them. I mean, if you look at, at uh, when I tried to, I was going to try and do pans this year, and the problem is, is I haven't done anything with IBJJF. I haven't done their their background stuff. I haven't done updated my profiles. So I'm um, sorry, guys. No, uh, so. so um, I'm still a purple belt in their stuff. I mean, my instructor, Ricardo Laborio was having issues. He's, he's an amazing instructor and they weren't recognizing him for the longest time because he didn't do exactly what they wanted him to do, you know? And I don't think that that's the true grappling Olympics because it, you only have to play their game. If you play their game, then you're in, but if you don't want to play that game, then you're not a part of it. And I don't think that paying a, a membership fee every year and, you know, doing all their, m- stuff that they do is is conducive to the sport it makes it hard and it makes it only for the people that have money that can do it and uh, i just don't think it's it's the right way no i i I do agree and now i mean mind you i'm not as tenured i'm a forever white belt um you know so i don't have as much skin in the game as as most but even still i think it's just it's weird you know but i mean in terms of it's kind of culty it's kind of culty it is yeah, 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 yeah. You get these guys that are in love with it, and it's cool. Like they love jujitsu and they love their sport, but are they really competing against the best grapplers? Like, yeah, there's amazing guys in IBJJF, and yeah, they would win Abu Dhabi too. But you know, it is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. But you know, that that's cool. They can have it because, again, you know, uh, there are other organizations. I mean, I. I didn't grow up wanting to be an Olympian or what have you. I, mm-hmm. I grew up watching, you know, pro wrestling and then later on, you know, MMA and mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff. And I, I, I wanted to be a champion. And I'm so grateful that, you know, organizations like, oh, Naga exists and they give out belts, you know, e- either belts or sword. And, um, you know, and you, you get to grapple against whoever. And, and anyone, yeah. yeah, I uh, I love I love Naga. I think it's a great format. I think it's a great rule set. They support all, all styles. Uh, Kip Kohler is awesome. He uh, he'll really work with people. And you know, you go to a tournament and you lose one fight, you can go up to him and be like, "Hey, can I get another match?" And they'll be like, nine times out of ten, they're like, "Yeah, let's get you another match." You know, if you go to an IBJJF tournament, you paid for flights to go out there. You paid a a big entry fee into the tournament. And if you lose your first match, you're done. There's no like, Hey, can I get an exhibition match at the end of the tournament? Like that's how you grow and, and you develop grapplers is you get that matches. And if, if, you know, I've had people to go and do those and then they lose the first round because maybe they're not the best in the world, but then they're not getting any experience They go out there, get tapped in 30 seconds. And then you just wasted a bunch of money. Yeah. That's not the way to go about things, you know? And I, I mean, that's not, you know, something that you, you know, at the beginning of your career, when you started your, you know, not just your MMA career, but your grappling career, that's not something that you anticipated having to do. And there's, well, I come from people. wrestling. I come from wrestling too. So, you know, it's double elimination and, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's better, you know, and then wrestling, you know, they have all those open tournaments and you can, you know, take down tournaments as a, as a teen and a kid, and you're going to get sometimes 10 matches in a day. And that's how you develop athletes is you get them experience and you put them through the ringer and, and, you know, you get those hard matches. And another thing I liked about wrestling and Abu Dhabi and stuff is there's no belt levels. You don't have to be a black belt. You just have to be the best, you know? And even me as a white belt, I was a little frustrated with jujitsu because I'm a two-time All-American in, in wrestling. Uh, I have years and years of grappling experience, but when I put on a gi, when I first started, I was a white belt, but I could beat a lot of the black belts in, in the room. And that was the one thing that I had to humble myself with, with jujitsu and understand that it's not about winning or losing or beating the best guy in the room like it is wrestling. It's about learning the art and taking your time and spending 10 years doing something. That 
is the, the good thing about jujitsu. And that also pushed me to become a better grappler was because if they would have just let me do black belt tournaments, I would have never developed my jujitsu. Like I, I did because I had to, you know, I could have just relied on my wrestling and took people down and passed guard and not went for submissions and, you know, but it pushed me to become better. Jiu-jitsu is amazing for that. But um, on the other hand, when you're a high level competitor, you want to compete against the best guys. You don't want to go to a white belt tournament when you can beat purple belt, brown belt, black belts. No, hundred percent. Now uh, something uh, happened with my audio. It continue. Um, I'm going to jump off. Um, okay. But just ex explain to folks how your kind of uh, inclination into wrestling started. Okay, so uh, I got into wrestling when I was about five years old, um, and that's when I started competing really competitively. Um, my cousin kind of brought me into the sport. Um, he, he, you know, I was like five years old. He was already 19, 20 years old. I got to watch him compete, so it really helped me out um, watching him and seeing the hard work and seeing the dedication and all those things. Um, it really pushed me to want to become that too, you know? So I, at a young age, I got to see high level wrestling and be around that and be in the same room as them. And so that really just kind of like, um, uh, that's tremendous. Me. Yeah. So that's, that's basically what, how, what got me into wrestling. And then of course, winning tournaments, being motivated, going through high school, having great coaches who pushed me and motivated me as well. Uh, and as an athlete, you want to have close relationships with your, with your coaches, with all those people. And, and then in turn, you're going to give them effort. No, 100%. And uh, I mean, that, I mean, were, were you playing or, or participating in other sports Prior yeah, to I did. I did all sports as a kid. I wasn't one of those kids that just did one sports. I played soccer. I played baseball. I did football. I did wrestling. But our wrestling coaches were good, so they make us. Even though we were still doing that, we were still wrestling year round. But I would also play other sports, and I think playing other sports as a as a wrestler or a grappler is going to help you with your coordination, with your with your balance, and developing other motor skills that maybe you wouldn't develop in just wrestling. <laughs> I, I think that's absolutely tremendous. And I, again, you know, especially right now where everybody's kind of like in this quarantine weirdness and what have you, you know, that's one, you know, you could Zoom class all day long, but I mean, you know, that physical activity, you know, that's lacking in, I, I guess, the current day curriculum for a lot of kids and adolescents. Yeah. So since quarantine happened, I've been, I've been working with a lot of kids, uh, helping with their wrestling and stuff, but yeah, they need that mat time. They need that mat experience to actually develop. And that's what kind of sucks about COVID and all what's going on is, is there's no competitions right now and we're going to, but and then on the flip side too, you can get a lot more drilling in. you can get a lot more uh, just plain work in and uh, that will benefit them as well. I try and keep all my, my, student athletes uh motivated you know and just remind them that you know things will go back to normal and you will get your opportunity but we got to keep working in the meantime no 100 percent, 100 percent. now i mean so in terms of your wrestling career um at, at what point did you kind of switch over to you know like maybe the submission grappling the you know bjj and, and, and eventually catch wrestling side of your acumen well, um, in middle school, uh, wrestling, uh, I had this one coach who was into catch wrestling and he would just like, he would pull us all to the side during practice every once in a while and be like, okay, these are the legal moves you can't do, but do them anyways, you know? And <laughs> so that kind of got me into submissions early on. And then of course, then, you know, UFC was coming out and all these other little shows and me and my cousin would, we had that little direct TV chip, you know, where you could watch all the pay-per-views <laughs> back in the day. So we would just watch those and I would see guys, you know, even guys that I knew in the UFC. So I grew up in the same area as Jeff Munson. And I remember as a little kid watching him wrestle at college level, at high school level and, and admiring him and then seeing him in the UFC years later. And then down the road, him becoming one of my mentors at, at ATT, um, it just kind of felt like everything since I was a child had fallen into place and 
you know, it's almost like I've uh, manifested all this stuff in my life. I remember as a kid watching Jeff and being like, man, I want to be just like that guy. I want to do all the stuff he's doing. And then coming up through college and kind of keeping track of his career. And then after college, getting into jujitsu and then I actually had a match against Jeff and, uh, and I, I beat him and, uh, that's how I got to ATT. He told Laborio and they brought me down for a fight camp with Tiago Silva and Rashad Evans. And when I was down there, they just, uh, we all meshed well and then gave me a job coaching wrestling at ATT. And, and that's how I got in with all those guys. And it was all through Jeff Munson. And it's just strange. That I've seen this guy my whole career coming up and, following him and then watching his videos and be like, man, I could do that too. And then actually having a match against him and then, and then becoming friends with him. And then once I was down at ATT, he took me under his wing and he took me and I fought internationally on the same cards as him and I would corner him and uh, train with him. And he was really one of my biggest mentors at American top team when I was there. I, I love um, Monson because I mean, he is a guy that, I mean, especially I, he just thinks outside the box. You just, you yeah. know, if you try to put him in a box, good luck. That's not. That's yeah, not and you're going to love him or hate him. Um, you know, I think people have this perception of Jeff that he's this certain way and he's this big muscle guy and he's probably, you know, intense and he's super soft spoken. He's yeah. thoughtful. He cares about people. I know he's like opened up schools in like third world countries and like, you know, when he's super busy himself and, and helping people, you know, and honestly, helping people is the biggest part of why we all do this. It should be at least, uh, I think. No, 100 percent, 100 percent. And I mean, that's just you were talking about, you know, the, the pieces falling where they may. Again, that's two good lineages like your coach basically going like, hey, here's some sugar holds, kids, you know, like whatever. And and. I mean, that's what we, we – it was known at the time and, and what we should know it as now as shooters, you know. Those, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those old-school shooters, right? And, yeah. you know, and then, you know, kind of being in the atmosphere of Monson, my goodness, like you couldn't have had a better start. Yeah, I mean, I was super lucky. Um, and like I said, <clears throat> I feel like it's kind of in my own way I've manifested this in my life uh, – and I knew I wanted to, you know, I grew up in Washington and then I moved to Nevada in high school and I, I just always knew I wanted to like travel the world and I wanted to live on the other side of the country and I wanted to do all these things. And then also just like putting myself in positions to where I could and taking opportunities, no matter what is important when you're trying to fight, when you're trying to do grappling, when you're trying to compete at a high level, people get caught up in like winning and losing and all this stuff. But like, there's reasons why you get opportunities to do things. Uh, you know, the universe, God, whatever you believe in will put those in front of you. And if you're too scared to take them, those are wasted opportunities. You know, I always say, and I, you know, my wrestling coach in college, Jason Valak told me this, like, take every opportunity, take every opportunity you get. And if you can't do it, then just tell them you're sorry and you can't do it. But if you close doors and you don't take opportunities, you're not going to, you're not going to make it. You're just not going to make it. It's risk versus reward. And that's what this sport's all about is risk versus reward. So if you're not willing to take those risks, you're never going to get the rewards. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more so now than ever because i mean at a time where people are trying to search to what the next avenue is you know beyond just working just doing the things that they did pre-march you know again you know and a lot of people say like ah oh, man this didn't work out for me or whatever but you know kind of peripherally you, you know you can kind of see looking into their situation and it's like the door was right there Right, and all you have to do is let's go through, and for some reason, you you did it, and that's why the chain of events that has occurred negatively have happened. Well, I mean, even even if you go and take an opportunity, you lose, you still got your name out there. You still gained a ton of experience, and you, next time you do something like that, you're going to get the different outcome you've been looking for. You know, and that's why I try and preach to my fighters. You know, I, right now especially during COVID, you have to take opportunities because there's only so many opportunities getting presented to people. So all my fighters now, we're, we're traveling to Florida. We're going to Maryland. We're going to Utah. We're, we're 
making it happen because these opportunities aren't coming for everybody right now. And if you're not willing to take them, if you're not prepared properly for them, uh, they're wasted opportunities and you only get so many opportunities in your life. No, a hundred percent, hundred percent, which I mean, I, I gotta, uh, you know, ask because I mean, you are a legit snake pit USA affiliate. So, I mean, how did that trend? I mean, that kind of come I into fruition. So what happened first was um, Kenny Lester. I don't know if you know him or not. Yeah, uh, he's Lester, a yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he, uh, we competed in college at a lot of the same tournaments. Uh, a lot of his high school teammates were on my college team and we always kind of like knew about each other. And then we competed at the feel of worlds against each other. We had a match. Um, I got Kenny, but he's a super tough, uh, competitor. And we've kind of always just kind of like liked each other's stuff on social media and all this stuff. And he's starting to do this catch wrestling stuff. And, um, they had this match for this uh, Quentin Rosenwig. That's who I'm competing against. Yep. And, uh, you know, uh, that guy fell out and Kenny hit me up and he's like, man, your style's a catch wrestling style. And I know, you know, uh, a lot of the history and you study it and all this other stuff. Um, you should do this catch wrestling match. And so I agreed to it. And then through him, I met Joel Bain and he, you know, we got to talk and he's a great guy and a, and a, me a great mentor. And, uh, you know, he, he just kind of asked me, you know, he's like, man, you have the skill set, you have the wrestling background, you have the jujitsu background, your style is more catch. Um, you know, like we would love to have you on as a, as a coach and as a athlete, you know, and as we've got, as we've talking, as we've gotten to know each other a little bit more, you know, he wants me to, kind of grow it on the West coast and, and kind of leave it here and, and build it here. And, you know, that's the, the goal. And we all know that like, if you're a serious grappler, a lot of like the catch wrestlers out there, they suck. They're not good. They don't, they don't cross train. They don't do jujitsu. They don't do judo. They don't study Sambo. And a lot of their, their technique is kind of lacking to be honest with you. Um, but if you get guys who have, nose catch nose jujitsu high level competitor those are the guys we need back in in catch wrestling we don't need the 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 guy who just is a fan of catch wrestling and says he has a catch wrestling gym and he doesn't have any experience and he kind of sucks and and he just wants the the name we don't want that anymore we want to bring serious people on high level wrestlers teach them grappling legit grappling legit catch wrestling not not watered down kind of crap you know we want to yeah. we want to we want to bring it back to the higher level we want to compete we want to be able to compete against all the all the big names in the game right now and and that's what we're trying to do you know i'm going to re be recruiting big names he's going to be recruiting big names and we're going to build this thing and we're going to have a legit catch team that can go do quintet matches and represent snake pit and win and go to ibjjf tournaments and win go to abu dhabi and win you know we don't want to be the snake pit guys in the garage that were jujitsu rejects we want legit athletes no i love it I, I love it and especially i mean there was um i think it was like a, a combat jujitsu that uh, eddie bravo tried to do and i mean uh, that was going to be at least in terms of heavyweights the kind of the pinnacle i think we was in it Bar josh barnett was in it gordon ryan was in it and whatever and then it just seemed like it all fell apart, you know, people getting injured. And, and I was just like, oh, man, you know, but, you know, what Sakuraba did with, like, Quintet and, and what have you and seeing Sakuraba and Barnett as teammates, I'm like, oh, my gosh, those are, I mean, literal lineages and students of the great mm -hmm. Billy Robinson, you know, and yeah. you know, I was trained by Billy Riley in, in Wigan and, and all of that jazz. And I'm like, yes, people are getting to see that. I mean, I howled. That that Meta Morris when uh, Barnett tapped out um, uh, Lester uh, Lister Dean Lister Lister yes yes the that man. was awesome that was yeah. awesome and and then all of the you know the the ardent jujitsu folk they were like you know before they were like oh that's you know why is he wearing shoes shoes and tights boo blah whatever and then they won. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, he won because he had grips and everything. And it was just like hypocrisy, complete and utter hypocrisy. Hey, I guarantee 
Every single jujitsu gym owner that saw that went the next week and worked that same move. That is a basic head and arm position, just applying pressure and, and staying consistent and trusting in the technique. You know, that technique is just as effective as a triangle or a, a Kimura or whatever you want to call it. Guaranteed a lot of what jujitsu people went and drilled that afterwards. Yeah, no, well, it, it kind of goes in waves, right? Because uh, I, I remember right after the, the uh, you know, the first combat jujitsu, right? Monday morning, literally every jujitsu school, you know, that has a social media or whatever, everybody's training open hand slaps, you know? Yeah. <laughs> we actually have a guy at my gym, uh, Laird Anderson. He's competing in Eddie Bravo's next uh, combat jujitsu tournament in mexico and he's a stud and he's gonna do amazing so guys keep your eyes out for laird anderson he's gonna kick ass i love it yeah i mean that's that's what we need more more kick ass right like yes, more kick -ass yes. grapplers. um you know and it's and again no disrespect because again you know they're Every style has been proven, right? Whether it be straight gi style, you know, sambo, jujitsu, judo, what have you, th those have been proven effective, right? Same thing, yeah. you know, with no gi, you know, in terms of whether it's just regular no gi or a 10 planet system, again, and the highest levels that has been tested to be true, right? So, no disrespect to any of those styles, but why can't catch me in that conversation? Yeah, well, it's because there's so much BS cash out there. To be honest with you, I don't blame other um, other styles for thinking catch is BS because there's there's so many fake people out there that's, that's doing catch or saying that they're catch wrestlers when they're not. You know, they're not really training catch. They're not. And then you get a bunch of guys who say it's catch, and then you get this watered down version, and people just look at it and think it's stupid, which. I mean, to be completely honest with you, when I was coming up through jiu-jitsu, I was like, yeah, jiu-jitsu would get wrestlers 99% of the time. But if you know and understand the body and you know and understand submissions, then a wrestler is the most dominant person you could put in a jiu-jitsu match. A thousand percent agree. And, and also in terms of athletics, right, and by comparison, you don't get any better con you know, conditioned athletes aside from soccer players than – wrestlers i mean Proven. if you look if you look at it now you're seeing guys figure that out you know and in the last 10 years jiu-jitsu people are starting to catch on to the work ethic that wrestling has the hard work the lifting the running all those things but you still have a lot of that lazy jiu-jitsu out there guys who just want to come in and roll and drill and that's it but if you want to become a high level athlete not just a high level jiu-jitsu competitor but any kind of athletic event you have to be lifting weights. You have to be running. You have to be watching your diet. You have to be doing all those things, you know? So jujitsu is catching up in that. They're all figuring it out. Like when you get beat by a white belt wrestler because they just outworked you because you're a lazy jujitsu person, um, you kind of like have to make some changes, you know, and understand that wrestling is a fundamental, huge part of jujitsu. If you don't understand that, where does every jujitsu match start on the feet? So if you can't get a takedown, you're going to have to pull guard. And honestly, if you're a bigger guy or you're not as skilled on your back, that's a horrible place to be. No, 100%. Uh, yeah, it's it's weird. But uh, again, I, I think, you know, it's like, a, what is it? Out of the out of the darkness comes the light, you know, and kind of all the hypocrisy kind of, you know, it, it's going to get found out. Yeah, and I think eventually, you know, in the next – 20 30 40 years it's not there's not going to be jujitsu there's not going to be catch wrestling there it's just gonna be grappling that's what it's going to be it's going to be back to the 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 beginning it's gonna be more pancreation without strikes like it's going to be everything it's not going to be just oh i'm a jujitsu player or i'm a wrestler or i do catch wrestling or i do sambo like everybody's catching on that like being on your feet matters. Being able to do takedowns matters. Being able to do throws matter. Being able to work off your back is super important. Be able to be have good top pressure. So it's not always it's not going to be, you know, at the higher levels like Abu Dhabi or if it ever goes into Olympics. Do you think they're going to call it jujitsu? I don't think so. I think they're going to call it grappling or pancreation or whatever. I can only hope. Can only yeah. hope. Yeah.
<laughs> now, I mean, that's that's got to be cool, right? To you know your your school and where you're training your students. I mean, you're essentially direct descendants of again, you know, Wigan and and Jake Shannon and and Billy Robinson. That's Oh, man, well, I mean, cool. that's the one thing that's amazing about my school. I feel like it sets me apart from different gyms in town here, from different gyms on the West Coast, is my lineage through jiu-jitsu, through Ricardo Laborio, Carlson Gracie, um, all the way up to Maeda. I'm super close to the source. And then also with the catch wrestling, I'm learning from guys who learn directly from Billy Robinson. You know, and so the lineage is there. The everything, the legit catch wrestling is there. The legit Brazilian jiu jitsu is there. The judo is there. So we're we have everything, all styles. You know, all my guys can do takedowns. All my guys can work off their back. I, I stress everything. So we have wrestling classes every day. We have jiu jitsu classes every day. We do MMA every day. We do kickboxing every day. And all of my guys are super round, well rounded. They're good at takedowns. They're good at stopping takedowns. They're good at getting off their back. They're good at submissions off their back. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. Eventually, most gyms, I think, most jiu-jitsu gyms even right now have wrestling classes. Maybe they're not ever doing it every day, but everybody understands that wrestling is important. I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of get a little teary eyed because that's, that's, that's what you want. You know, just everybody to have a even keel playing field and, and figuring out, I mean, if you're a consummate athlete and competitor, what is the best or, you know, what is the best situation to be in and, and what have you. So I love that. Again, you're, you're, I mean, you're like the air ahead water. You're pretty much bottled at the source. But, you know, and, and, and that's why I feel it's kind of my responsibility uh, to actually grow the sport. You know, I, I feel like that I can really pull guys in high level guys and make them better. And, you know, um, I've had my gym for three years now and we have a ton of fighters and we have a ton of grappling submission artists here and we go compete all the time. And I would say in the next two, three years, my gym is going to be right up there with all the other names. You know, I have a, a group of amateur guys coming through right now who almost all of them I feel will be in the UFC or in a major organization doing big things. It's just, we got to develop them and we got to give them the time and we got to give them the experiences. That's why at an amateur level, all my guys are traveling all across the country. We're going to big shows. I'm trying to get them the toughest fights we can get because I believe in my style. I believe in my guys and I believe that we're going to show the world, you know, our name is going to be right up there with American top team with Jackson, with Rufus sport, with all these big gyms, we're going to be right there. And it's going to be out of Reno, which we're developing the fight culture here. You know, before my gym, there was just jujitsu gyms here and like one Muay Thai school. And now we're, we're, I'm building the culture and you're going to see my guys are going to come through and they're going to be good. I love it. I love it. You know, um, yeah, it, it brings me joy. It definitely does. Now, I mean, in terms of your, you know, obviously we, we spent a large part of uh, this basically talking about your grappling aspect that, you know, going to top team, you know, uh, by way of, of Monson, right? Um, mm -hmm. what, at what point of your, your kind of mixed martial arts career did you end up at ETT? So um, I graduated college and I basically didn't want to work a regular job. I knew I had a bunch of, I had a, a huge competitive spirit and I wanted to keep growing on that. So right after college, I actually got into boxing and I got into amateur boxing and I did that for two, three years, even before I got an MMA fight, I was doing amateur boxing matches. I won the South Carolina golden gloves. Um, I wanted to become proficient in some sort of striking before I even thought about doing MMA because I understood that if I couldn't beat somebody up on the feet, then I, and I couldn't take them down, I was going to be in huge trouble. So I started doing boxing first, uh, did a bunch of USA boxing fights and then, uh, did a couple, couple of the Butterbean tough man, uh, shows back in the day. Um, I don't think they really do them anymore, but, um, and then from there, I started getting into jujitsu. I was in jujitsu maybe a couple months when I had that match with Jeff and I beat him purely on wrestling. It was not jujitsu at all. It was takedowns and points. And I was just trying to, I learned the rule set and I just figured out my game plan from there. Um, but yeah, the whole ATT thing happened through, through grappling, you know, that's how I met all of them. And then once I got there, 
Um, and I helped out with that fight camp for, with Tiago Silva. Um, it just rest fell in place. I, I had amazing, uh, coaches there and I had amazing partners there. And it, at that time in my life, I was also growing as a, as a, as a young man. And I was uh, learning a lot about myself and I just felt like at that place was, is I grew a lot. I grew a lot. I also faced a lot of adversity because I was living on the East coast by myself and I was away from family and I was doing all these things. And, and when you're stepping out of your box, it makes you grow and it makes you change and it makes you see things through a different perspective. And, you know, that's, that's what HT really did for me. No, 100%. No, it's, it's cool. <laughs> you're good. You're, you're good. Um, yeah. Sorry but, guys. Yeah, so, so, um, in terms of, you know, your, your MMA career, um, I mean, what has, there's, there's gotta be a, a amazing moments. Like what sticks out to you kind of hands over fists, like in terms of important moments in your career? Well, um, it's, 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 you know, my biggest win I would say is Vulcan Ozdemir, uh, back when he, you know, Ken, he was in his prime too, um, I was expected to lose. I just went to the ultimate fighter. So the whole ultimate fighter thing didn't work out. I, uh, I just, because of ultimate fighter, the way it is, and they don't tell you a lot when you go on the show. I just, I wasn't in the shape that I needed to be in. And if you watch that fight, I fought Corey Anderson. And, uh, I mean, I dominated in the first round. I feel like I was close to finishing him multiple times. I was getting multiple takedowns and you see in the second, the end of the first and in the second round, I just completely gassed out. I filled up with lactic acid and no excuse. I just uh, should have been more on point. And then after that, it was like a real dark time in my life. I like put all that work and effort to get to that spot. And then when you, when you lose at that level, you feel like your whole career is, you know, kind of not going to happen at that point. And so, you know, thankfully uh, I saw that Bellator was putting on a show in Reno, like uh, just like a couple months out of ultimate fighter. And, um, it was the only reason why I jumped right back in. Cause I wanted to come back home. I wanted to fight in front of my friends and family. And they told, they, they set me up to lose. They brought me into Vulcan. They thought he was going to be the champ, which he's an amazing fighter. And, uh, and I was like six and two at the time. I believe he was like 10 or 11 and no, he was undefeated. And um, I just told him I wanted the fight. And uh, so they gave me the fight and it wasn't supposed to be on the main card. And then a couple fights fell through. And then I was like the co-main event on that card and it was on spike TV. And that was the first time that I felt like, um, I don't know, like vindicated, I guess, after, after that loss. And so I really wanted to go out there and prove myself. Not only that, but uh, I had spent time in Switzerland and I actually had trained with Vulcan one time and uh, we didn't do any wrestling and we didn't, we just did some like boxing rounds cause I had just had a fight in Switzerland and I was in Switzerland for like a week and I went to their gym and I was like, Hey, I just want to get some work. And I think I did a wrestling seminar actually at his gym and we got to train. And then when I saw that fight come up, I, I knew that I could beat him, you know, and everybody else thought he would smoke me. And I just knew in my heart that I would beat him. So come fight night, uh, you know, it's in my hometown. I have all my friends and family there. The place is packed. People are screaming. And I just had this energy about me. And I went out there and I dominated him. I don't even think he hit me once. He kicked me once in the leg. And from there out, I dominated the striking. I dominated the takedowns. I dominated the grappling. And uh, at that, after that win, I knew that um, I had what it took, you know, to make it really far. And then that whole time in Bellator, they were trying to give me matches where I would lose, you know, they're giving me all the undefeated guys. They're giving me all like the big time UFC uh, guys that they had on their rest roster. I fought Rodney Wallace. I fought Felipe Lins, who also won the PFL million dollars is in the UFC. Yep. Um, so I fought guys all super high level and uh, I kept winning, you know, I fought four times in four months, which was kind of hard because I'm, I like to eat food and uh, start to keep my weight down like that. But um I cut a ton of weight and I made it to the finals and I got caught. Liam McGregor caught me in one of his inverted triangles. Same thing. He caught mm -hmm. Tito in. So he caught a couple guys in that same kind of, it's just he's a different look. And so, you know, hats off to him. He, he won. And, um, but that, that kind of like solidified me. So after the Bellator tournament, um, 
Scott Coker took over. That's when Bjorn was out and Scott Coker wanted to renegotiate my contract and I didn't really like it. So he gave me an option to leave Bellator. So I, I left Bellator and my plan was to try and get back into UFC. So right after Bellator, I got a fight with uh, Vinny Margulies. I don't know how to say his last name. Margulies, Super- yeah. Margulies, whatever. <laughs> I, had a t- I had a fight with him for the Titan FC belt down in Florida. And I was back in the room training and, uh, and uh, I was coming home after an event and I drove like a little moped scooter thing in Florida because Florida is awesome and you can do that kind of stuff. And, um, and I was driving home and this guy freaking <clears throat> ran me over and, and I had to get two knee surgeries. My shoulder was super jacked up. I couldn't train or do anything. And it took me out for about three years. And I felt like it took me out in the, the pinnacle of my career, right when I was going to get back right at the head and I was getting older because I didn't even start MMA until I was like 25, 26, because I wrestled through college and I graduated and I wanted to do all that stuff first. So my window kind of closed on me right then. And so it took me about three years to rehab my knee back to where I could actually roll and train and run and stuff again. And um, <clears throat> I had moved back to Nevada because I didn't, I couldn't work. I couldn't do anything. I wasn't making any money and uh, I was kind of losing it down in Florida. So I left ATT. Uh, I left all that training behind. I came back to Reno. I worked a construction job and I realized I hated it. I hated all of it. I still had competition in me. And so I just opened up, a. I rented a $750 space. It was basically a glorified garage. And I, um, I opened my gym and I got guys in there and we started training and I started feeling good again. And about four years after the accident, I took a fight and I won. And, um, and then my gym kind of blew up from there. And uh, I had to focus more on building the business and becoming stable in my life because even if I wanted to get back to the UFC at that point, I knew it was kind of a long road and I know I didn't have five or six fights in me and then get a UFC contract again. And then, try and make another run. So I just focused on my gym and I grew that and started training and started competing in jujitsu a little bit more again and training wrestlers and doing all that. And then, uh, this last year, I just kind of, uh, I got my gym to a point where I have a bunch of training partners now and I have a bunch of guys in here that can help me and push me. And, um, I kind of got that, that spirit again to want to go compete. And so, uh, that's what led me to, to Kenny Lester and to Joel and getting in the snake pit and then starting to do these catch wrestling matches. And then hopefully I'm 36 now get another couple fights, maybe get a small contract in Japan where maybe I can do catch wrestling and get on an MMA card and then do some pro wrestling and kind of see what can happen in the last couple of years of when I can be athletic and be still be strong and still be fast and still, you know, feel good in there. Oh, I I can't wait. Uh, I mean, Beer Crossface gets unleashed on the world yet again. That's uh, version two. Hey, I like to take credit for, uh, I, I've said this in a couple other interviews, but I created that, the whole Khabib, Crossface, Crank. Like, I was one of the first guys to really get that in a match, and I know he didn't see that match. I was like, I'm going to steal that. But we have similar styles. Khabib's a wrestler. He's a grappler. He understands all aspects of it. And it's a, neck cranks are a huge, huge uh, submission if you can get them. And, and a lot of jiu-jitsu guys are guys that um, – have done jujitsu. Um, they don't like it. They don't like getting cross faced. Come on in. Sorry, guys. No, you're good. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's where it all came from. And and then, so yeah, cross uh, cr- cross face crank. That's what it is. I, I love it. Um, now, in, in terms of, I mean, you know, when you have that itch, especially if you are a competitor and a high level competitor at that, and especially in the manner in which your, your career kind of got thwarted, you know, it was unceremonious. It was, I mean, you were in a title fight, you know, it was super anticlimactic. Uh, it felt like, man, 10 years of hard work just got thrown down the drain. Um, I was, I got super depressed. I was in a really bad spot mentally for a really long time. And it just took really, uh, positive people around me and, and good people around me and, and to build me back up and kind of make me feel like I could do it again, you know, and, and 
now I'm 36. I don't want to look back when I'm 45 and be like, man, I could have did this. I could have did that, but I wasn't brave enough to take new opportunities, you know? So right now I'm a, I'm a yes guy. I'm like every opportunity I get, I'm just going to take it and I'm going to run with it and see what I can make happen again. Uh, yeah. that And that's it. That That's, I mean, what we all kind of need to do and hopefully people can harness, especially at a time of uncertainty, kind of harness onto your story and kind of find it within themselves to, to, to optimize whatever life condition that they have. Yeah. I mean, it's important, man. And, uh, you know, that's one thing I, I like to preach is, is like, as long as you have the desire, it's not over. You know, a lot of guys, you know, I have a couple of amateur guys that have lost fights and they get in their head and they start, Oh, I suck. Or, Oh, I, but, but sometimes like, the, the, the rainbow is right over the mountain, you know? So if you just keep pushing through, you're going to be in like a beautiful Valley soon. So yeah, it's hard now. And, and, uh, and you, you might feel down on yourself, but if you just keep pushing and keep believing in yourself and keep working, these opportunities are going to come back. It's not like because you lost a fight or because you lost a match, these opportunities are going to be gone. All you got to do is double down on the effort and then show people that. And then those opportunities are going to come back, you know? So you know, sometimes when you, you think it's the worst, the, the, the best is right around the corner. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I mean, something that you do, uh, you did in terms of uh, optimizing your life condition, you know, is assuming the role of coach, you know, I mean, yes, you built your business, but a large facet of that is basically taking what you have learned over your illustrious career and applying that to others. And, that's not something that most, you know, top level fighters can do. Um, so the, the the ones that do, like you and Barnett or Ben Jones or Chad George, Cormier. Are, Cormier is an amazing coach. Yeah. Cormier is an amazing coach. Uh, you know, it takes experience to get experience. So, like, the only way that I show these guys, I show them my knowledge, I give them my knowledge, but then I, I make them go out and, and apply it, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's all about experience. It's all about listening to your coaches. It's all about being humble and, and understanding that, that you don't know everything and that you could always get better at everything. And, you know, it doesn't not, it doesn't necessarily mean that like you had to be a high level to be a great coach, because there's a ton of coaches out there that's really never competed that is they're amazing, but it helps with like the little things like understanding weight cuts, um, mentality for me, mentality is everything. You could be a, a fighter that's maybe not as skilled as another fighter, but if you have the mentality, like you're the, the king of the world and you're the best. And even if you're not, sometimes ignorance is bliss and, and just thinking you are, makes you dangerous. A lot of guys you see in the UFC aren't technically the best strikers or aren't technically the best jujitsu players or, or wrestlers, but they have this uh, uh, belief inside of them that they're great. And when you believe that you're great, it makes you great. It makes you dangerous. It makes you all these things. So like skill has a huge part of it, but like confidence and belief in yourself is, is to me the most important thing. No, 100%. You know, uh, I, I I often joke like uh, sexy, right? Sexy is not a look. It's a state of mind because, yeah. uh, I, I, you, you know, anybody who's been to uh, any sort of nightlife have seen people that aren't as cosmetically appeasing and walk out with, you know, like a, a, a literal 10 just because they exude that. You know, and the confidence is, is key. Confidence and taking opportunities. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. Now, in, in, not to say in terms of like your best student or anything that that's unfair to do, but uh, in terms of your you being a coach, and it could be a general or a specific instance, like what, what kind of brings you the most joy about coaching your students, especially when they get it and that spark? you know, kind of comes into their eyes. Like what, what has been your proudest moment or moments? Um, well, I mean, honestly, my, my favorite people to work with aren't, aren't the athletes. I mean, I love all my athletes and I love working with them, but it's those breakthrough moments for people that were maybe really out of shape at one point in their life. And now they can go run 
10 miles or, you know, maybe they were overweight and now they've lost 60 pounds and their whole life has changed. Um, those are, that's what makes coaching uh, important to me because I feel like in life in general, not just fighting and jujitsu, uh, helping people and, and helping people grow as people is like what it's all about. You know, it's like, that's why we're here on this earth, I think is to help each other and to uplift people and to um, maybe help people get out of depression or maybe help people lose the weight or maybe give people friends that were struggling with friendships before. And that's the beauty of jujitsu. That's the beauty of wrestling is in these sports, you can go into a MMA gym and you'll see different religions, different uh, orientations, uh, different, um, genders, different political views. Mm -hmm. You're going to see them all on the same mat, working together, loving each other, helping each other, laughing, having a great time, you know? And that's to me, the most important thing about this, the byproduct, having great fighters, having athletes make meet their goals and then also help people. That's why I love this so much. It's not going and winning fights. It's not, competing at the highest levels, my guys competing at highest levels. Yeah. That's an awesome byproduct of all of that. But the biggest thing is helping people, normal people, people who don't have those desires, but people maybe are struggling in other areas and then becoming stronger, become hardened, becoming maybe then an athlete. Like that's what I really love. And that's what I really enjoy. No, I, I love it. And, uh, you know, you mentioned a, a great, you know, a kind of analogy that everybody, everybody, you know, it doesn't matter your gender, your orientation, your political status, you know, and it's, it's weird because this year more so than any other time in at least my life, and you're only a year older than I, so, you know, we're, we're in that same kind of age bracket, but, you know, everything has become so kind of like divided, right? And I almost feel like the world needs a little bit more grappling and MMA and combat sports in their life to kind of figure it out. Well, you know what the se the secret is 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 wrestling and jiu-jitsu and MMA and boxing and all these sports create camaraderie between people that's different. Like if you have com camaraderie outside of the gym, it's because of your political affiliation or because you hang out with a certain people that you fit in with. And that's where you get, but out in the real world, it's like us versus the world, you know? And in here, it's all of us. It doesn't matter your pol politics. It doesn't matter your preference. It doesn't matter who you are because it's every everybody in this gym versus everybody else. So that's what brings everybody together. So you lose sight of the things that really don't matter, like politics, uh, what people like, what people don't like. Like you don't think about those things in the gym. What you think is we're a group, we're a team and we have to uplift everybody. So we're now the strongest team and we can go and win our matches and, and we're doing this together. And we lose sight of the things that don't matter. And you kind of gain perspective on the things that do matter. And then what's awesome. And this is not just in my gym. This is like in every jujitsu gym, every fighting gym is then these people carry that spirit outside of it. And then they spread it to their family, their friends, the people around them. And then that's how you create a different culture. But if we don't have a, a people in the world changing it and giving people different ideas and different perspectives, our culture is never going to change. In in the U.S., uh, people who aren't healthy, people who are out drinking and smoking and uh, indulging in TV, indulging in social media all the time. They don't have camaraderie. They don't have. It's a, it's like us against the world but we're only doing it through hate we're not doing it through love and if we can get more people doing things with love instead of hate then the world's going to change and how is that going to change through everybody coming together it's not going to be through uh this president or this president or this person or this person or this idea or this idea it's an accumulative idea of the group of people that you're around and if we can all spread those good ideas then that's how you make the world change I agree. I agree. You know, at some point, the bickering has to stop and we actually have to sit at the table and confront some some uncomfortable hard truths, some hard truths. Yeah. You know, we have to talk about things and not be able to get mad at each other. But but also what's great about it, uh, the gym is nobody feels the need to talk about that stuff here because we don't care about it because we all love each other regardless. And that's that's the beauty of it. And that's why I like it so much. Yeah, uh, I, I, and as do I. You know, of all the the fights that I've gone to and covered and watched on TV, my favorite part is 
that last part once the final bell sounds and the referee waves off and whatever, and you see both you know, fighters, you know, combatants, coaches, everybody just kind of come together and you know, and you and some awesome things happen, like cross training in between gyms, you know, because you know these two fighters fought. You know where you see that a lot too is like the Olympics, and that's like all sports. You know, during the Olympic years. Uh, I feel like uh, the world's like a little bit better of a place, you know, like the, you see people on TV, you see people from like China and the U S standing right next to each other talking and like appreciating each other and all those things. And that's a beautiful thing to see. And, and during those Olympic years, the world sees that everybody's watching the Olympics. Everybody's seeing after the matches or after the games, everybody's giving each other hugs and congratulating each other. And there's not a lot of bad sportsmanship in the Olympics. And you see, uh, people coming together versus pulling each other apart. You don't hear about the wars and you don't hear about the politics Olympics. It's all about people from all over the world coming together and, and making this awesome couple months of events. And, and, and I feel like in the Olympics, that's what they kind of push, you know, is all working together and doing things together and, and helping each other. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I agree. I agree. Now in terms of, I mean, obviously, you have, you know, become a, a well-traveled, you know, a, a, almost a philanthropist in a sense, right? But there have been so many people that have helped you in your own kind of path to daily life and human life and uh, the role of a fighter and coach. So let's get some shout outs out of the way, my man. All right. Well, um, you know, my coach, my wrestling coach growing up, Rick Rakovich, uh, he was a huge person in my life. I didn't have a, uh, a good father at home. I didn't have a father at home. I, so he was my, that male role model in my life and he's an amazing person. And he was my wrestling coach from the time I was five until I was 15. Then I moved to Reno and I had another amazing coach who was very religious and, and he was all about being good and helping people and all those things. And I learned from him. And then my college wrestling coach, Jason Valick, uh, and Kelly Ravels, they were huge people influences in my life um, as men, like as a young man growing up, and then going to ATT and being under Laborio and and Master Junior and and Jeff Munson and uh, Mikey Rod, uh, my boxing coach. They all were my coaches in fighting, but they were also my coaches in life. I looked up to these people. I watched their mannerisms when they talked to people. I would watch how they were with their spouses. I would watch how they treated other people. And when I admire somebody and I watch them like that, I'm going to mimic that. And I think that that's a, uh, one thing that that almost all athletes do with their coaches is they they if they respect them, they mimic them, you know. And so I do the exact same things to people as Laborio did because Laborio is one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in your life. I've literally seen that man give the t-shirt off of his back to people like, Oh, you like this shirt here? Here it is. It's yours now. And that's, uh, that's what I love. And that's why I, I love the sport so much is because I had mentors like that who didn't just teach me how to fight, but they taught me how to be a good person. And I, everybody I sure I'm not saying I'm a good person. I'm just saying that I admire people who are good people and I try to reflect that. I uh, know. I, th I think that's, that's fair. And, uh, you know, at least you have the, the blueprint, you know, the, uh, the foundation, right. On yep. what you do and what you don't do. And, you know, you as a, a person and a male and adult can go one way or another, but uh, again, you had a template there. Yep. You know, everybody, everybody's going to fall short of what their idea of per perfection is and nobody's perfect and nobody, you know, but understanding that you make mistakes and that you can correct them and you can change them the next day will make you a better person. Exactly. Now, this fight, you're, I mean, you're competing for I'm competing the again. Wrestling, catch Wrestling World title. That, I mean, again, being a, a Snake Pit affiliate, this is I it's mean, huge. probably the coolest thing that I've yeah that that I've heard. Um, so, talk to us about the the match and how it came about. Um, so, I'm, I'm competing. I don't even know if I'm saying his name right. Clinton Rosenwig, Rosenwig, whatever you want to say. He's a tenth planet black belt. He's a super good grappler. He doesn't have a wrestling background, um, 
But that then again, he is super dangerous. I've seen him destroy people and I'm not taking him lightly. I respect him and I think he's going to be ready too. So it all comes down to willpower and what you willing to leave it out there. I'm always willing to try my best. That's what I always do. I'm always willing to leave it all out there and I'm not ashamed of anything that I do. So all I'm going to do is go out there and give him everything I have. I'm going to give him my jujitsu, which is, one of the best lineages in the world, my catch wrestling, which is one of the best lineages in the world, my folk style wrestling, which is one of the best lineages in the world. I feel like he maybe has never competed against somebody on my level and my experience. And I'm much older than him and I'm much wiser than him. I like to think that anyways, he's my, he's probably a smart, great dude too, but I have to build my confidence up. And that's what I tell myself is I have the experience I have positivity, I have hard work, I have dedication. And if I work hard and I do everything right, I deserve to win. So I'm going to allow myself to win that match. I'm not going to hold myself back by not working hard, by not putting the effort in, by not eating right, by not sleeping, by doing all these things. If I do all the things right, I deserve to win. And when I go out to that match, I should have the confidence that I should deserve to win. Oh, you get no disagreements from me here. Now, I mean, and talk about visualization into action. I mean, have you kind of uh, thought in your mind, like, uh, the outcome of this particular matchup? A thousand times. (laughs) I I believe in visualization. I know what he's going to do. I know what he's going to try. If he thinks I'm not working that, he's crazy. I'm working it every single day. Um, And... You know, I'm not going to be surprised like other guys, especially Curran. I think Curran was intimidated. I think he was surprised. I think he went into the match cocky. I think he thought, he, you know, all these things. I'm going in knowing I've done the hard work, knowing that, yes, I can lose the match, but I also deserve to win the match. So, uh, you know, like I said, you just have to go in there and you have to put it all on the line and leave it out there, you know, and, and I'm working all the things that I know he does and the things he's going to try and I'm game planning all those things. I'm not going to say what I'm going to do, but he, he knows, you know, I'm watching all of his matches. I'm having people mimic him. I'm doing all the things that I need to do to win this match. I love it. I, and even the, just kind of putting out it out there, but the outcome of this match, should it go in your favor, you're bringing the catch wrestling world title back to a direct lineage. Yes. Yep. You know, I understand that everybody wins and loses. And when we go on there that day, 50% of the people on the card are going to lose. You know, that's just the name of the game. I don't, I can be okay losing if I tried my best, but I know also if I tried my best, I should win. Hands down. I should win. It's rule sets in my favor. Um, the experience is in my favor. Um, I've had higher level matches. I've, I had a match against Cyborg when I was a blue belt and I did just fine. So I'm not worried about it. He doesn't intimidate me. He doesn't scare me at all. I'm not worried about his heel hooks, ankle locks, all those things. I'm good. I'm good. I love it. I love it, man. I cannot wait for this at, at all. Like I'm chomping at the bit. I mean, I think this and Bloodsport, uh, and, I mean, obviously, uh, Paramount, my wife's birthday, but, you know, the, your fight and Barnett's Bloodsport on the 11th, that's pretty much like my October. That, that's that's what I want. That's what I want. So, so the, the so, event that I'm competing on, um, Kenny Lester's putting it on. It's going to be on Fight TV. It's a hybrid card, so it's going to be catch wrestling. And pro wrestling, you know, the main event, I think, is going to be Scott Steiner and Stefan Bonner in a pro wrestling match, which is crazy to think about. You know, yes. also uh, another match on the card is uh, Phil Baroni and uh, Joe Riggs. They're going to do a, a catch wrestling match as well. Um, there's a couple other higher level jujitsu guys on the card. Like you're going to see a really cool hybrid card on this event where you're going to see pro wrestling jujitsu black belts high level wrestlers and if you're a fan of grappling if you're a fan of pro wrestling add kitty lester on facebook he's going to be coming out with all the media very soon and uh you're gonna be able to watch it on fight tv i cannot wait yeah and jesse velasquez says they're bringing back the ogs and uh mma at least in california it looks like it's coming back so uh that's 
That's awesome. And oh, yeah. here's a little bit of a stirring of the pot. But Rocky Nelson wants to know, out of season 19, who did you dislike the most? You know, um, I don't dislike people. Uh, they're, I can't even remember. Honestly, I don't even remember the guys' names. Uh, I hate that I lost to Corey. I hate that I lost, you know, so I don't hate the guy. I think Co me and Corey's talked after the fight. I think he's a great guy, but I hated him that day. You there know, you especially because I, I felt the fight slip through my fingers. You know, I, I had him in dominant spots. I love Corey, but at that time I didn't like him very much, you know, but he's a great guy. He's super nice. He's uh supportive. He's reached out to me. I've reached out to him. You know, he's actually asked me to come in and work fight camps with him before because I'm one of the only guys that can take him down, you know? So uh, that day I, I hated, actually, I take that back. I hated myself m mm -hmm. more than anybody on that card. That's who I hated the most was myself. That makes sense. That makes sense. And I guess to quote the, the plain white tees, hate is a strong word, but I really, really, don't, really don't like you. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's where I was at with that. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, Kelly, uh, obviously you talked about the fight, but let people know if they haven't already done so, where can they find about more about you, the gym, and everything that you're doing on social media and website otherwise. So um, I'm not a huge computer guy. So if you want to contact me or talk to me, hit me up on Facebook Messenger. I don't really get on Instagram. I'm kind of old school. If you want to talk to me, I have Instagram and all that and I'll get on it. But really, I'm on Facebook. Add me Add my gym, Combat Sport and Fitness. Uh, it's in Reno, Nevada at 75 Southwells Avenue. Um, Google it up. My phone number is on there. You want to talk to me, call me. I don't I'll talk to anybody. Um, and yeah, that's where I'm at. It's Reno, that's Nevada. Remember the I name Combat it. Sport and Fitness. You're going to be seeing in the UFC real soon. Woo! I love it. I love it. I can't wait. And uh, Rocky Nelson says, you've come a long way. Keep grinding, bro. So there Thanks, you go. Man. Thank you, Rocky. There you go. Well, Kelly, thank you for taking time, especially as you're in fight camp, uh, to you know uh, share some words and stories with us here at According to Woods. Man, you, this is awesome. Um, and I'll let you get back to it. But again, for Crossface Kelly Edmondson, I am According to Woods, and we are. Hey, this is Ada Zang. Make sure you subscribe to.